So uh, Eric Cantor lost his seat in Virginia. A lot of reasons. Everybody has a million. But first, let's find out who the guy he is he lost to. They call him a Tea Party candidate. His name is Dave Bratt, B-R-A-T. He's a professor. Uh, and he's uh, they call, they say he's Tea Party Tea Party E, even though he <laughs> he he doesn't claim to be a Tea Partier. He's just to the right of Eric Cantor. <laughs> okay, so he was on with Chuck Todd, right? Who's got he's really bringing back the Caesar, and uh, <laughs> Chuck Todd. Why 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 not why why not just put pull a Lawrence O'Donnell. And say that you were in an accident, in a car accident in Germany, and uh, just go get your hair plugs. Just go do it, because that's what Lawrence O'Donnell's doing right now. He was in an, oh, he's in an accident in Europe, and he can, but when he comes home, he'll be fine. Mm-hmm. I bet, I bet. Yeah, he's not walking around with a baseball hat on right now. I know how that goes. <laughs> anyway, the so the goatee is supposed to distract from the forehead. Goatee actually does. That's it. Just it does a little bit uh, distract. Anyway, so he Chuck Todd was on with Dave Bratt, and he asked him about the minimum wage. Here's Dave Bratt's answer to the minimum wage. Where are you in the minimum wage? Do you believe in it, and would you raise it? Uh, minimum wage, no, I'm a free market guy. Uh, we, our, our labor markets right now are already distorted uh, from too many uh, regulations. I think Cato estimates you know, there's $2 trillion of regulatory problems. And then throw Obamacare on top of that. The the work hours is 30 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, you can only hire you know 50 people. There's just distortion after distortion after distortion, and we wonder why our labor markets are broken. So should and, yeah, are you in- yeah we we wonder why our labor markets are broken. And you know why? What he just said. The reason why our labor markets are broken is because now people get health care when they work. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you decide he's back, to? He's the Cato Institute guy. Yes. Why did you decide to break our economy by letting workers see a doctor when they get sick? They're supposed to a go to work until they drop. And because uh, the economy tanked right when the Affordable Care Act was passed. Oh, you can't. Yeah, that was the beginning of the end. Stock market boom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Did, didn't they institute the Affordable Care Act in uh, at the end of 2007? Yeah, late 2007. That's right. <laughs> I think Dave Brad also has a problem with just paying employees. Yeah, I, I think that's part of the regulations. You should well, pay somebody. We're going to get to that. We're going to get that. So here, uh, they ask him. They ask him to uh, to clarify. He asked him to clarify. Should there be a minimum wage, in your opinion? Um, I I I, I don't have a well crafted response on on that one. All I know is if you take the Long run graph over 200 years. First of all, let me just put point out. He's a professor of economics, <laughs> running for Congress. They asked him if what his position on the minimum wage was, and he doesn't have a well crafted one. The professor of economics. That's like asking the professor of English, "Hey, what do you think about Shakespeare?" I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> Not really thinking about much. Is it, did he write in English? But is the minimum wage in the Bible? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the loaves and fish miracle is, and that was socialism. <laughs> Jesus was a hippie. I can't even believe these people like him. Anyway, here he goes. He's got more to say. Of the wage rate, it, it cannot differ from your nation's productivity, right? So you can't make up wage rates, right? I would love for everyone in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, children of God to make $100 an hour. Right, I would love to just assert that that would be the case, but you can't yeah. assert that unless you raise their productivity, and then the way follows. You, we, you, you know, the, it sounds like the you're making a case against. You can mandate you. T- so it sounds like you're making a case against a federal mandated minimum wage. Um, I'm, I'm just making the case I just made, which is that you cannot artificially make up wage rates. Right. They have to be related to productivity. Let me ask you about. Tr- uh, I, I don't understand why Chuck Todd asked him what young workers, children of God in sub-Saharan Africa, should be making. That was an inappropriate question for Chuck Todd to ask. I mean, this guy is... Children for... of God, we all know what that's code for. What is that code? If co- there was a Christian in sub-Saharan Africa, they should get a decent wage. Oh, is that what... So here... Well, let me just... So what he's saying, what he basically tried to say in a way that would confuse normal people because they don't think about things in this way because he's an economics professor, is he's saying that you can't pay people more money as a wage than they're producing 
for work. So if people are only producing ten dollars worth of products, you can't pay them twelve dollars to got, make. So that's what he's saying. And he has a graph that includes seventeen ninety seven in it to help improve his point. Yeah. So let me just. So what do you have to say, Mark? Well, Jimmy, in that case, in that case, wouldn't the wages? be in conjunction with productivity, so workers' wages should be higher right now. That's the distortion in the market, is that wages are not higher. So that is the... workers' productivity yes. in America has far outstripped, so, has, has far outdistanced their... Uh, the but, but why, why is Mark using facts right now? No. Mark, that, really. So here, I actually have a, I have a chart. <laughs> so here's my chart, and it's about... Um, do you see it? Do you see it, Ben? Now, the red line is uh, the average income of the top 1%. The yellow line is productivity. Mm -hmm. And the blue line is the average overall wages. Now, you'll notice that as productivity has gone up since 1982, wages have not gone up. Wages have been almost stagnant. But the 1%'s wages have gone through the up over 240%. Yeah, well, they were way more productive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that they rigged the system to now uh, extra, uh, extract money from the economy and put it in the 1%'s pockets. That's not what happened. They didn't. That's not. It couldn't be. It just happened when it all started when Ronald Reagan became president and then it accelerated when Bill Clinton decided to deregulate Wall Street. It couldn't be then. It couldn't be any of that. So what he's saying about the minimum wage is factually incorrect. You know, if you look really closely at that chart, like right <laughs> between 2006 and 2007, it looks like right. workers got nearly a nickel more. Mm. So It went up a little bit. Yeah, then. so shut up. OK, yeah. basically, yeah. I love that he used as part of his answer. A 200-year graph. Yeah, a 200-year graph. <laughs> yeah, tell me what fucking happened in 1811 again. Yeah, tell me what. Tell yeah. me how our economy was going before yeah. the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> tell, tell me that. So he. So here's the the cool part about it. So this is the guy who just beat the second in command of the House of Representatives, right? So he would basically be the, I don't know, third most powerful person in the country, be the president, the Senate president, the spe Speaker of the House, then him? Yeah, he'd be like, yeah, top top five. So he's up there. This is the guy who just unseated him is going to be the next guy. Here's how he answers a direct question. Ready? Green rebels, would you, do, would you be in favor of that with the U.S. military helping to arm the... the the moderate yeah. Syrian. So he's asking him, would you be in favor? He's asking him a foreign policy question. Would you be in favor of the America, America arming the Syrian rebels? Okay. Here's his question. Here's his answer. Hey, hey, Chuck, I thought we were just going to chat today about the cel celebratory aspect. I'd love to go through all this, but my mind is just, uh, I didn't get <laughs> No, I understand that. He says, <laughs> hey, Chuck. He says, hey, Chuck, I just thought we were going to talk about the celebratory aspect of me winning. I'm not really prepared to talk about all this stuff. I'm in the middle of running for Congress. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I thought I was going to come on your new show for a party. <laughs> You're going to ask me policy questions. Can we do that after the election? Because right now, i got to go pop some champagne and stick a bottle up Eric Cantor's ass. <laughs> Whoa, this is entrapment. This is entrapment. You're trapping me here. So this is, I want to hear this whole answer all, at once. Let's hear the whole thing. Green Rebels, would you, do, would you be in favor of that with the U.S. military helping to arm the... the the moderate yeah. Syrian rebels. Hey, hey, Chuck, I thought we were just going to chat today about the cel celebratory aspect. I'd love to go through all this, but my mind is just, uh, I didn't get No, I understand that, but in, I just want to get no, a I, sense I of... I love all the policy questions. I'm happy to do more, but I, I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the uh, victory we had, and I wanted to thank everybody that worked so hard on that campaign. And I'm, I'm happy to take <laughs> policy issues... Uh, uh, some other time, I yeah, guess. Yeah, maybe after the election. You know, like not when I'm on a news show being interviewed by a reporter about my campaign. This is not the time to talk about politics. I'm happy to take those questions. Maybe, I don't know, if you meet me in a men's room somewhere at a hotel. Or um, <laughs> uh, maybe I could talk to you over a urinal. Uh, we'll get have a try. Who, see who can ruin the urinal cakes faster? I don't know. Someplace <laughs> where a discussion about the Syrian rebels would be a little more appropriate. Yeah, this yeah. is not the place. This is not the place. I prefer to take policy questions when I'm not around. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the guy that just beat Eric Cantor. That's I great. don't know. Dave Bratt seems a bit of a rascal. Mm, he, he, mm. Do, he does seem like a little bit of a rascal. Um, I, I find him charming and charismatic. I understand why people voted for him. Because <laughs> he, he has absolutely no platform. He looks like, honest to God, 
He looks like Eric Cantor's brother with lighter hair. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't he? Doesn't he look just like Eric? You know Cantor? what? He looks like Eric Cantor's Christian brother. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. I, I th- hang on, I'm trying to find something that's relevant. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, here we go. So, so you, this guy wins by going to the right of Eric Cantor, who's incredibly right, but we live in a crazy freaking time in this country now we sure do so in the washington post they had a the story you know was like the most exciting thing to happen at the washington post in some time and they had a blog going uh, online where they just kept updating adding stories when we learned that the guy he's running against plays basketball with him it was the basketball buddies from randolph macon college running for congress right Uh uh-huh and then this guy named robert costa who used to write for the national review in the greek right Greek, I suspect Greek, yes. <laughs> and Robert Costas, the National Review, that's a big right-wing publication. Yes. And he was a reporter for them, but he covered, like, the infighting among the Republicans. And he's, I presume, a conservative. That's the only way he'd be writing for the National Review. The Post hired him. And here's how this guy, these are the first two paragraphs of this story. The Washington uh, Post hired this guy for the National Review. Yeah, a couple years, last sometime like 2013, I think. He's talking about the guys who will be poised to become to move into leadership now that Cantor is gone. So he says here for the job, for the whip's job, right? Which was uh, because the whip would move up maybe to be Cantor's job and the whip job would be open. So representative Steve Scalise, if that's how to pronounce it, representative Steve Scalise, chairman of the conservative Republican study committee will run for majority whip, setting up a race against the more centrist Peter Roskam of Illinois. (laughs) Peter Roskam is not centrist. I don't know who that is. What's his deal? I mean, first of all, he's a uh, Republican uh, member of Congress. There, yeah. there are no centrists. There are no. Peter Roskam <laughs> is as conservative. Peter Roskam would have been one of the 10 most conservative members of Congress 30 years ago. Right? Next paragraph. No formal bid will be announced today, but Sp- Scalise is already privately whipping votes and making the case that he can be a red state voice in a leadership currently lacking a hardline conservative. Wow. Uh, I mean, a leadership with <laughs> John Boehner and Eric Cantor, it, it lacks a conservative. They, well, you know what the leadership need? They need a conservative voice. Yeah, <laughs> they've done nothing. Yeah, that, I, that, 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 that This Congress has done n- literally nothing. But how about the framing? Like how things have changed? Yes. Those guys aren't conservative enough for conservatives, which is, of course, why this guy lost. But to me, that's just like we're, I mean... Th- that's like a that paragraph would have made sense in 1964. Yes, but in 2014, no, nothing. There are, I, I couldn't agree with you more.